I am going to keep uh, exposing this wrong doctrine because this has been an infestation among uh, Christians who are interested in studying. And this is the group that you're going to bump across even among uh, Koreans too. It's called Calvinism. Calvinism. So, yep, we're going to keep... We're, <laughs> We're going to keep exposing uh, Calvinism right here. What does Calvinism teach? Calvinism teaches that in a doctrine called election. What is election? Basically, that man does not have his own free will. So God chose which group of people will be saved. Wait, then that means then the other people he didn't pick to be saved, then they're lost, right? Yeah, then there's another group that they're lost. So unfortunately, these people... They die, and they go to hell. So they fall from grace. So, they're saved, and they're lost. So they have verses to give this kind of idea that there are people who have been elected for salvation, and man's free will had no play at all. So you did not choose for your salvation. God planned something a long time ago, where he elected you to get saved. We believe that is heresy. Amen. We believe that it is your choice so you don't blame God on who goes to heaven and hell. Yeah. We're going to go to Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Acts chapter 18, verse 9. Notice, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. Notice why. For I have much people in this city. So this verse, Acts chapter 18, has been famously used. So I've seen quite a few people mention about this passage in Acts chapter 18. So you want to know this passage, Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, notice it seems right here that God told Paul, don't worry about preaching in this city because I already have much people elected that I knew would get saved. So these people are going to get saved. So it seems like, see, that God chose these people. He elected these people to get saved. They couldn't get saved out of their own free will. Now, in order to debunk this doctrine, we got to understand this. There are already much people God specifically chose and elected to get saved or not get saved. But the context, it's going to prove otherwise. Why is that? It's not the elect who are about to get saved, but rather people already saved who needed to be taught the word of God. You might say, no. Well, yeah, look at verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. See that? Because look at verse 7 and 8. They skipped that one. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, noticed it was, see, he did it himself. It's not like God forced his hand to do it. Believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. See, because they got saved at verse 8, Amen. verse 9 said, so don't be afraid, Paul. I've got much people. So continue to teach them the word of God. That's why verse 11, see that? They were taught and trained the word of God. It's not that God specifically chose and elected who would get saved and who wouldn't get saved. It's actually people who were already saved that needed to be taught the word of God. That's what God was talking about. So this includes as well as verse 2. Look at verse 2. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. They already got saved. God never mentioned verse uh, 9 and 10 at the beginning of the chapter. He only mentioned it after these people already got saved. Why? Because God was trying to tell Paul, see, these people are already saved. Don't worry, these people will be taught the word of God. Not that... Okay, these people are going to get saved. No, they already got saved. Yeah. What, I guess they need to go to a re-election process? So it doesn't make sense right here. So we'll see right here that according to verse 2 and 7 through 8, you can't argue election because they were already elected right then, then and there. 
They were already saved right then and there. Otherwise, you're going to have to argue verse 2, 7, and 8. These are the elect. And then verse 9 and 10, they just lost the election. They need to get elected again. Calvinists don't believe in that because they believe in tulip. Tulip is five points in Calvinism. P, perseverance of the saints. They believe once you're elected, you can't undo it. So you caught them right there. That You caught them that, okay, so then you just believe they lost the election? What are you going to do about that? Okay, so let's also look at some other Calvinist verses that they would like to use. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. So, one of the heresies of Calvinism is called irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. What is irresistible grace? Meaning you can't resist His grace. So, they're going to argue election and then irresistible grace. Within irresistible grace, you cannot resist His grace. So if God gave His grace on you to get saved, there's no way that you can resist it. There is no way that you can reject it. Your free will has no play in it. So God had to bend your arm and make you get saved. All right, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to what? will and to do of his good pleasure. So notice right here, it seems like that God is willing them to do his grace. So that is a problem. It seems to show that you have no will in play according to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. However, the problem is this. How can you even do that if God is not in you? God has to be in you first for that to happen. See, unless he got you saved, unless he got you elected first, then you can start to do that willing thing. So you didn't get saved yet. So look at verse 13. For, see, because, based on this reason, it is God which worketh what? In you. So he has to go in you first. So the passage just simply shows, once a person has God in him for salvation first, then he is able to do God's will and work in his life. Amen. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It's not that God willed you to get saved first. No, you got saved first. You have to do that first. Then for God, he can be able to work his will with you. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. There are plenty of verses that show that once you are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ first, you're able to do God's will and work in your life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye what? Receive the word of God which ye heard of us. See, they had to get saved first. Ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which what? Effectually worketh also in you that believe. Remember Philippians 2, 12 to 13, God working in you? Yeah. See, until you, your free choice first, I accept it, then God can work in you. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. The tactic of Calvinists is to mix up salvation with God's working in your life. No, the best way to always tackle a Calvinist is that you always have to prove salvation first. That's what you got to keep arguing right here. Look at Colossians chapter 1. We will read verse 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to what? His working, which what? Worketh in me mightily. Now look at that. See, in verse 29, he's trying, he's striving to do his working, which worketh in him mightily. How about that? Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. It seems like that God was bending arms right here for people to work for him. No, it showed right here you had to get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ first. In you. That's the basis. Calvinists always mess this up. It's a condition. 
When you follow the condition, then you can have God working in you. Calvinists, they always believe in something unconditional, that God has to do it himself. No, it's based on a condition. What does condition mean? You have to do something about it first. You have to follow his term first, then God can start operating. Amen. That's how you debunk Calvinists. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. We'll look at verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that what? Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So notice right here, this has nothing to do with your works for salvation. It is a gift of God that you have to get saved by. Then notice the result at verse 10. For, see, based on salvation by grace first. For, notice what it says. We are his workmanship created, ah, what again? In Christ Jesus. See the condition again. On two good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ah, now you see right here God's ordaining, God's plan, God's working that you're supposed to follow. But it's based because you got saved first. That's always the thing first. Amen. It's based on this condition first. Amen. Condition, salvation. It's salvation first. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 21. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 21. Hebrews 13, verse 21. So with these Calvinists, you'll notice that how you tackle the verses that they use. They always like to use eisegesis, exegesis, and blah, 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 blah. They'll use those kind of terminologies. But then how you can tackle them is that you pay attention to the verse itself. And when you pay attention to the verse itself, you can see right there that within the wording, it already showed you a condition involved. It also showed you a sequence involved, salvation first, then this happened. Eisegesis, eisegesis, says one Calvinist. Then you can point out to him, well, did you read your eisegesis three verses behind? Like at the book of Acts chapter 18, they didn't do that. Calvinists, uh, I kick them very hard because some of them can be very arrogant and very jerks. Uh, just watch James White debate, and then you'll just get turned off by him. You'll become a Muslim rather than a Christian just watching him debate. <laughs> that kind of guy is a wicked man. He is a wicked man who just uh, done so much damage to the cause of Christ. I am so glad that he and, other, he and another cultic pastor are made for each other living at the same city together. <laughs> that they can both give each other a hard time. I'm just so happy to see that. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 21. Make you perfect in what? every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through what? See, based on that. Until you're in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So you better thank God that you're saved in Jesus Christ. Because of that, now God can start working in you. Amen. Now God can start planning things out for you. The Holy Spirit will operate within you. And you ever took a drink of alcohol and then you just had the Holy Spirit bugging you about it? You know why? He can't go back on his promise to you. He has to work in you. That's why we have some people praising God, actually, for the chastisement they went through. And you, you've heard people praying about that, saying that during testimonies. You're like, what? Why? Because they're so grateful God did not leave the work in them. Amen. Why? Because Pastor Kim bended your arm and he said that you got to be, a, I'm a Calvinist, so you're going to be saved. And then Pastor Kim bended your arm, made you get saved, so that you can start rejoicing in God chastising you. No, you have to have free choice. Obviously, you have to have free choice to get saved to begin with. Otherwise, you're a bunch of robots and I'm a cult leader then. I'm a cult leader who forced you to get saved to make you serve God. How about that? Calvinism, then it's no different from the Catholic Church, I think. It's like a system of slavery right. where it enforces people rather than people having the independence and the free will to make the choice themselves. And you're all big boys and big girls. You can make the decision yourself. And you can start distinguishing what's heresy and what's right. If you don't do that, that's why you get deceived by preachers and teachers, especially online. It's really bad. All right. We're going to look at Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Acts chapter 5. And then I want your other hand to go to Acts chapter 11 as well. Acts chapter 11. 
Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 11. Now, this is one of the most annoying verses that Calvinists will use because they're going to accuse you of teaching works for salvation. That's confusing, right? So here's the thing. Do we believe in good works for salvation or do we believe faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone? Yeah, faith through Jesus Christ alone. But they're going to accuse you of lying. They're going to accuse you of lying and they're going to say, no, you are including works for salvation when you witness to somebody. And you're like, what? I don't get it. <laughs> so this is their argument. Let's first look at Acts chapter 11. Verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So God gave them repentance. Now, keep your hand here. I want your hand to stay here. Go to Ephesians 2. We believe in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? Yep. Now look what the Calvinist does. This is so hilarious. This is so hilarious what the Calvinist does. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2. Now look at what some of these wicked people do. And then you're going to go, what? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Amen? It's nothing what we do. Ah, they got you. See, it's nothing what you do. They mean that. So literally, you don't do nothing. So because you made the choice yourself to believe on Jesus Christ, see, you did something yourself. What in the world? You, you, some of you are like looking at me confused. You're like, I, what? That doesn't make sense. Exactly. You have to have several THDs, DDs, PhDs, go to Fuller and Dallas to be able to brainwash yourself, to convince yourself, yeah, this is all, yeah, this is all messed up. So you have to go to seminary. All right, so right here, based on Ephesians chapter 2, and then you notice Acts chapter 11 as well, and then look at 2 Timothy as well. Look at 2 Timothy. So these are something that God gave to you. Not you accepted yourself. You did something is not the right answer. It's not the right answer. Literally, God has to do it to you. Look at the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, please. Chapter 2. And then we'll look at verse 25. 2 Timothy 2.25. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure... Notice, we'll give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So based off of Acts 11, 2 Timothy chapter 2, the, and Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, God gave what? He gave grace to you. He gave repentance to you. It's nothing that you do yourself. Now, uh, the obvious answer against this is pretty simple. You got to realize this. In these verses, did you read what it says? It shows right here that it's a what? Gift. You'll notice that God granted something that God gave. You know what that means? It's a free gift that is offered to you. It is up to you to accept it or reject it. Amen. <laughs> They're very hilarious. These guys think that Oh, well, you know, when God, uh, it's nothing that you do yourself. Well, yeah, because God gave it to you as a gift. What else does it mean? But you have the choice to receive it or to reject the gift. Oh, my goodness, these people. They just don't, okay. The thing that boggles my mind is that these people, when they see that God gives it to them as a gift, they feel like, oh, well, you know, when I get this gift, then that means I have to receive it. No, common sense, no. If someone gives you a gift, you have a choice to accept or receive it, right? Are you just going to stand there like a robot until the guy shoves it to your throat and say, hey, take it, take it. You can choose to walk away from it. So uh, this is just common sense right here. But look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Didn't you know you can reject the gift? 
They think that when God gives you a gift that you can't reject it. No, look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. These people, man, they're something else. They just have to educate themselves outside. It's so ridiculous, Calvinism. We're going to look at uh, verse 1. Therefore thou art what? Inexcusable, O oh man. Okay, you don't have an uh, excuse. Why? The reason why is because God blessed them with something. Look at verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O oh man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? So notice right here that this person is truly lost, condemned. He is a lost person. He is not saved. He's not the elect. Look at verse 4. Or what? Despise it. See, he's rejecting something. The riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Wait a minute. Repentance was supposed to be a gift from God to them, right? And he's giving it to them, but they're rejecting it. How about that? Now look at verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. See, it's his fault. When God offered you grace and repentance, you reject it. And because of that, God is upset with you and he's building up his wrath. That's why verse 6, who will render to every man according to whose deeds? His deeds. See, it's his choice. His choice. So you got to realize this. It's something that God will judge you on your accountability, on what you did. God's going to judge you for that. What did you do? You rejected my son. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It's basically you absolutely do nothing. No. Fooey. Look at Romans 10. That's just fooey. Look at Romans 10. These people, they... One, that just doesn't make sense, common sense English. If you talk to a normal soul how to get saved, they see that when they believe on Christ for their salvation, it's not a work that they're doing. Anyone knows that, except the PhD Calvinist from Fuller Seminary. So look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Now we're going to read verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. This has to do with salvation. Now look at... Verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. See a works issue here. They're doing something by their own works rather than Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6, but the righteousness which is of what? Faith speaketh on this wise. Look at verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee even thy mouth and in thy heart that is the what? Word of faith which we preach. What is it? Verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Wow, you stomped them right there. See, you know what God considers to be faith, not works? It's when you yourself tell God, I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ for my salvation. Look at that. Some people are against the sinner's prayer. Why would you be against that in verse 8? It's the word of faith which we preach that you confess with your mouth. So you'll notice right here that this Calvinism is a heresy. That is a doctrine from hell that just makes people uh, not sure when they got saved. They can't pinpoint to you when they got saved. But here's the thing about Calvinists. Because they're so much bombarded and pressured by this, now they're becoming more evang evangelistic. A lot of them are even street preaching now, believe it or not. They caved into, uh, they caved into the altar calls. They caved into giving the gospel to people and leading them to Christ right then and there. You know why they caved into that? Because Bible-believing Baptist was way ahead of them doing that, doing all the soul winning, getting people saved. It made Calvinists look bad. So they're like, okay, we better do it too. So these guys actually are not true Calvinists then. It makes me question th their belief now. Do, are you truly a Calvinist? Why are you out trying to win them to Christ then? Isn't it of your own effort that you're trying to get them saved? It's very strange. But it's also very troubling that these people, when they witness to them, that's why they won't get them saved right then and there. Uh, I forgot his last name. It's always hard. Side Bruggenbauer or something like that. 
And then you also got Paul Washer and uh, James White. And sadly, Ray Comfort has been influenced by this method. That's why they attack sinner's prayer. That's why they attack this kind of method, because they don't like this where you get them saved right then and there. They believe that the Holy Spirit has to work in their heart so that the salvation can be genuine and real. Now, do we agree? Yeah, we agree that we got to make the Holy Spirit deal with them, make their salvation genuine and real. But here's something else. That doesn't mean you leave them hanging out to dry. They're right there, ready to get saved. You just get them to do it with you. Otherwise, when you're done with them, you know what happens? Right when the Holy Spirit was working in them because you gave them the gospel, not because you wrought it in your room at home like it's some dry Calvinist, but because you went out evangelism, you and the Holy Spirit was working in you to get them saved right then and there, you stopped the process. They just went back home. The Holy Spirit was convicting, working in them when you were witnessing to them, not when you left them hang out to dry. Let that be a lesson.